Hey, my name is Ryan. This is my brother, Daniel. This is Rolls in the Family, and we are here at the end of May to talk about our best board game plays from the last month. This is something we do every month. It's fun to see what's actually hitting the table. What are the reasons these games are standing out to yeah. us? Um, is being fun to play. We'd love to hear what games you've been playing. If you want to drop in the comments what your top play from the last month is, um, it's fun to hear. It is. You know, we, we like board games. If it isn't evident, we like board games. We like hearing about what other people <laughs> are not, playing we're, as we're well. Not, we're not just faking this. We, we actually do. Yeah. That's actually a poster. That's wallpaper behind Daniel. Yeah, actually. it's a green screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't angle I'm your camera right any now. differently. <laughs> yep. Uh, as always, we'll, we'll include uh, links in the, the description below to all the games we talk about if you want to check them out. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump in. We'll go with Daniel's number three. Yeah, my number three play of uh, May right here is a game that uh, we're actually going to be releasing a review on very shortly. Uh, it's going to be coming out Did here. Did you plan in this? The future. Yes, <laughs> we planned this. Uh, just played it recently. A game that is uh, criminally underrated and yet uh, is really near and dear to my heart. And that is Seven Wonders. Uh, it was really funny because... Wasn't, al- wasn't always criminally underrated. But here in this year, 2023, know, doesn't get the love it, it used it's, to. It's so sad because... Seven Wonders, you know, is is kind of I don't know. Would you call it a classic at this point in the board game world? I would put it in that modern classic. I mean, it, it's one of the like if you just look at raw ratings on like Board Game Geek, Seven Wonders has some of the most yeah. just ratings of any. game. And I think rightfully so. I mean, it obviously takes a very familiar mechanism of cart of um, you know taking cards card drafting passing card drafting, yeah. uh yeah forgot what that was called um <laughs> yeah. but and and but does it in a way that's uh you know there's a little bit more strategy to the game than maybe something like a sushi go or something like that um but but plays in a in a really consistent amount of time you know depending on no matter how many players you're playing with but i played a six player game of it so this was like the perfect situation you know you got six people uh we played with everything we included uh leaders uh we had those i don't know you call those black cards that are kind of the it's from the city yeah we yeah. we included all of those um so there was a little bit of a refresher that needed to happen but even with a little bit of teaching and refresher we still with six players played in 40 minutes which at the end of it you're like wow it felt like i've played a just a full yeah. game uh in that short amount of time but playing it again you know i remembered just how fun kind of the spatial element of the game is like i really love how you really do feel connected like to your neighbors in that you're really kind of looking at your neighbors you know not only seeing what they're paying mm-hmm. what their cards they're playing you know to see what you want to give them but also what resources do they have like that very much impacts you and what you can do and you don't want to get blocked out of yeah something and and yet the people across the table i'm not really paying attention to as much so there's kind of this uh and and then military obviously you know you're paying attention to each other's military so it's got a got this cool kind of almost spatial element of you feel closer to the people next to you and whatnot um but it was a really fun game uh you know what's cool about seven wonders is there's really no one clear best strategy um you know and and an example Mm -hmm. for this is i had a really I ended up winning, you know, that's why I made the plays. But uh, I had a fun yep. strategy where I got some really great leaders that worked together. I got one that gave you two coins for every yellow card you play. So I think that was the first one I played. Nice. My second leader was I get a victory point for every yellow card I play. And the last one was I get an extra victory point for every three coins I have at the end of the game. And yellow cards tend to oh, give nice. you lots of so coins. So I am just spamming yellow cards, going crazy, getting tons of money. But then the, the guy next to me is just playing all greens, you know, and, and you know how out of control yeah. technology cards can get. I think he scored over 50 points yeah. just off greens and I was not doing my part in blocking him. Uh, so it's it's fun because people can just go in completely different directions. You can go military. You can you could build your wonder. You could not build your wonder. You yeah. know, there's a lot of different options. And I think that leaves it pretty f- it makes it pretty fresh every time you play that game over and over again. Yeah, I think I think the leaders expansion helps with that a lot, yeah, too, for sure, 
Because it just gives you some upfront and kind of a unique combination of things and what order am I going to play them in um, to be able to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. I think you made a good point that like, you know, any drafting game is inherently going to have the interaction of I don't want to pass too gar- could have good of cards to my the next player. So kind of that hate drafting right. thing. But Seven Wonders adds some other things the fact that you have the military next to you, the fact that you can pay resources to neighbors yeah. next to you, that more than other uh, drafting games, like you really do feel connected right. and invested in what your neighbors are doing. And I think that's a big reason why like the feel around the table feels a little bit more interactive yeah. than just a normal drafting yeah, game. Yeah, and so I knew, you know, I had that leader coming that scored extra points for money, and so I specifically played a bunch of resources out that I assumed my neighbors would want, and so they were just paying me all game, and then at the last age, I dropped that leader, and they're like, oh, no. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a lot nice. of fun. Uh, d- just reminded me how enjoyable that game is, and stay tuned for the review coming out. There yes. we go. We, we've played Seven Wonders a few times. A few times. <laughs> we finally feel like we can review it now after, after what, 90 <laughs> yeah, plays? Yeah, it's been a lot. Yeah. Okay, Ryan, what's your number yeah. three of May? Yes, my number three came early in the month. Um, it was a situation where I had a, a work event, and we had some time on the tail end of it that some people were around. Had the, I had brought some games to, for, for a situation kind of like that. And it's always those hard situations where, you know, I haven't played games with any of these people pretty much. Yeah. And like, you don't know, like, how do they feel about board games? What are they looking for in a game? So it's a very hard situation to like pick a game for. And I decided to pick one that's relatively new to my collection, which was Long Shot the Dice Game. Wow. This is a game that can go. Yeah, you, you, I don't think you know much about this game. I know nothing. Um, <laughs> That's not what I was expecting. But it goes two to eight players, and it actually plays pretty well from two to eight players. Like It, it, um, it kind of has two different pieces to its DNA. One is that the theme you're betting on a horse race. And so the game is all about placing bets, and ultimately you want to like have the most money at the end of the game. But then it kind of combines that with the DNA of a roll and write game because every turn someone's going to roll the two dice that say which horse is going to move in how many spaces, like one to three spaces. Mm -hmm. But then everybody starting with that person gets to use the horse die, which there's eight different options to take some action on their personal sheet. And so there's a bunch of different things you could do. You could pay some of your money to place a bet on that horse that was rolled. You could, there's like this concession section that you can cross off a matching uh, circle and you're trying to like complete rows and columns. And whenever you complete a row or column, you get any of the benefits below, which could be money or letting you manipulate horses or doing some of the other actions. There's even the ability that you could buy a horse. So the eight horses have uh, each have like special abilities and if you buy the horse, one, you're going to get a ton of money if that horse places in the top three. Mm-hmm. But then you, for the rest of the game, get whatever special ability that horse has. So you're kind of like, you know, choosing what... And money is, vic- you know, money is points at the end of the game. So by buying the horse, you're kind of giving up points to get this ability and potentially place. So it's a very interesting... Um, Dynamic, and I thought it went over really well. Maybe, maybe some of the <laughs> comment down below the group, if you were yeah, in this game. Like, Man, and you I played this re- <laughs> played this really weird game with Ryan. I don't know what we were doing, um, but I thought it I thought it went well. I think we were playing with seven people, um, and it was my first time kind of getting to see that game in kind of the setting that I pictured yeah. it for, um, and. It, it's just fun. Like I like the the fact that everybody's turn, everybody then gets to use that value. Like there isn't as much waiting for your turn in a game with a lot of people. But then it's fun. It's similar to a game that we've also played quite a bit, Camel Up, where there's just kind of like interesting dynamic of how the race is going. Because one of the things that makes it interesting is not only does the horse that's rolled move, but you look at that horse's card and certain other horses will have an X and that means they also move one. And so, like, when horse six moves, horses three and one might also move one. And throughout the game, one of the actions that players can do is they can actually add X's to those cards. So now I can make it, I may be invested in horse five. I could add horse five to horse six's cards so that whenever six moves, five will also move one. Okay. So there's kind of a lot of this, like, manipulation of stuff. Um 
but it's very interesting because you end up in this dynamic where, especially with that many people, like everybody's betting on a bunch of different horses. And I might look at a given horse that I think is doing well, but there's probably other people at the table that I'm like, if that horse wins, they're getting more than me Mm -hmm. if that wins. Like they've bet more or they bought the horse. But I may still want to bet on that. But if I'm going to bet on that one, I need to bet on something else that's going to differentiate me from their bets because otherwise I know I'm probably going to be behind. So you're kind of like trying to carve out your little combination of bets that's going to give you, um, you know, a good chance. But my favorite thing about this game um, is how it is built into the DNA that it's going to have an exciting ending. So you play until basically three horses finish. And, you know, after the first one finishes, it goes on the podium as the first place finisher. And so three times you get the exciting moment of which horse is going to cross mm. next. Because whenever you roll that die, like, you know, the one that gets rolled could move one to three and other ones get dragged one. Um but, it, you know, I had one. I, I didn't have a very good game. I got last place out of the seven <laughs> people because the horse that I bought and was really kind of relying on got one away from the finish and then just got passed by two horses <laughs> for second and third. So I didn't yeah. place. Um, but it was those exciting moments of like on those last rolls, I could have gotten it and that would have swung mine. And that's what I want from a game like that. I mean, it's, it's a game that like once everybody knows that you're probably playing this in a half hour or less. Um, it's just fun, betting, excitement. It gets kind of that energy at the table. Um, so I enjoyed it. I, I'm definitely looking forward to playing it more because I've only that's, I've played it twice, but one was two player. It wasn't like super representative <laughs> yeah. of of the game. But they have different horse abilities that you can mix in and out. So you can kind of mix that up every game. Um, and so I'm kind of excited to just have another game in my collection that fits that like can go up to eight players, but isn't like a party party game mm-hmm. as far as like you know the style that people maybe think of it's got a little bit more to it um so yeah awesome. it was a fun play i felt like i didn't ruin the uh situation <laughs> yeah. by uh bringing out Not, a game and having everybody trust I fe- me i feel like sometimes <laughs> in those situations it's almost nice when you take last place because you're like so wanting everyone yeah. else to you know and en- enjoy the game and if you just like you know introduce a game and just yeah. blow everyone out it's like oh come on uh, but I yeah I always say I must have taught the game so it's true. well because that's what did. it must it's have so been. Amazing. Yeah, no, I I think yeah. honestly the those type of games that you recommend for situations where yeah just big group of people who you have no idea where they're at it says a lot about the game and how mm-hmm. uh, like that's a big a big you know pro that a game can have that it's one that you feel comfortable introducing to people that you're like i have no idea what their tastes are like that's almost kind of a i don't know its own like category in games is good it is yeah kind of like that safety to fall back on and admittedly i was being risky here because i hadn't played it yeah that was a horrible like a group like that (laughs) and so you know i'm like man am i want am i leaning towards it because i'm wanting to play it or like but i'm like i think it this is like the type of thing for this situation i'm Um, glad it worked out so yeah Yes, it, it worked out. Enough to make my number three. I don't know if it made uh, any of their... I'm sure they're all on their own video podcast talking about their top yes. board game plays of the month. <laughs> and hopefully it made right. it. So. Uh, let's pass it over to you for your number two. Okay, my number two, I'm really excited to talk about. Um, it's not a game... I don't own this game, but I got to try it for the first time this last month. We were visiting... Uh, some friends and uh he had this and my my wife had been talking about this game for a while because she had tried it with him before said it was a lot of fun i got to try it also thought it was a lot of fun and that is dice forge um so oh that's right i forgot you got to try this one i i got to try it and you know i've played obviously deck builders i've played bag builders uh, this is the first dice builder I've ever played. And I don't know if there's other dice mm-hmm. builders out there, but I I think there are now. This was probably the first one. It's there's not it, many. Yeah, it's a very unique. <laughs> I mean, obviously you you just component wise, it's a very unique thing where you literally can pop off the face of each side of the die and upgrade it throughout mm-hmm. the game. And it was so much fun. Uh, just a really enjoyable experience. It actually reminded me a little bit of Space Base, a game that both of us enjoy. Yeah. In that you're like kind of customizing the your probability of 
going different routes. Mm-hmm. And what's really cool is that there's a lot of different options for how you can customize the face of these two dice that you have. So, for example, I had a, I early on got upgraded one of the face of my dice to every time I roll it, I get six gold. Um, and so then I ended up getting, you're, you're kind of moving, you also have a board out here that you can go around and you can buy these cards um, that can kind of, you know, interact with your, uh, with, with kind of the combo that you have. And, and so I got a card that I could spend gold to get victory points. And so that was kind of, I was kind of leaning into getting a lot of gold and victory points. But what's fun is that everyone's rolling every turn, like it's together. So it's not like it's other people's turns and you're just kind of, you know, sitting around like, okay, come on, I want to get to my turn again. But, um, you know, similar to space space, everyone's invested on every person's turn, which is, a lot of fun. I just thought it worked so well. I mean that it since you're invested every per and in, on every person's turn, you're just always uh you're always rolling, you're always just getting more and then okay, what can I get now? You get excited when you get that amazing roll that you customized. It was really yeah. really fun. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I enjoyed it so much that I think it, it might be on my radar of of wish list games because yeah, it was really simple to teach. Um, and I don't know if space space and this are like, I, cause I don't own space space. You do. And I really like that game as well. Yeah. And that's one I've considered. I don't know if it's like they overlap too much. Do they, are they different enough? But the, pl- that play of it was so much fun that, uh, yeah, I'm really, really glad I got to try, try dice forge this month. Nice. Yeah. Is there much player interaction in that? Like, well, I, I, I don't know enough about yeah. it to know how you like affect other players. So the player, I mean, the main player interaction is that you, uh, well, I guess it's not really play interaction, but everyone's like rolling simultaneously. There are cards that can like hurt other people that you can get, like mm-hmm. cause people to lose, you know, resources and stuff like that. You're also on, there's kind of this center board that has, um, uh, it's kind of a, um, uh, almost like a worker placement but your workers you're not like they're never in front of you you're kind of just moving them around this board to go to different locations where you can buy cards that's how you buy those cards and so there's a little bit of like if someone's in one place you know um i think it blocks you it was at the beginning of the month and i'm still trying to remember all the rules uh so if i'm explaining this wrong you know comment down below uh but but anyways yeah so there was a little bit uh, for the most part you're kind of doing you know your own thing, building up your own strategy, but just the whole upgrading of the dice. It's such a unique, uh, component thing and was, and I just love rolling dice and uh, having them upgrade was a really fun thing. And, uh, yeah, we'll see if I, if I get to own it sometime, but, uh, uh, it was a really, really cool game. So happy. I got to try nice dice forge. Yeah. I don't think I've played any of the dice crafting games that at least i'm aware of i know uh tom layman who did race for the galaxy and roll for the galaxy has a newer one i think it's called dice realms Mm. um that's you know very much his style of game as far as kind of the engine building but uses the crafting of dice And i'm assuming they Um, all have to like basically be the same component wise right like the where you're popping the sides of the dice out and putting new- as far as like between dice realms and dice forge yeah like, like i'm i think it's, it's a similar it's concept a similar yeah thing. yeah 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 so it, it is always fun when like there's examples of like a manufacturing innovation or like a new type of component yeah. kind of opens up new design options um i know a similar one uh mystic veil vale, which is by uh the guy that made space base i think it was one of his first games That one was kind of innovative because it had a card crafting system in that you were like building up cards using transparent cards in a sleeve. So like by putting multiple transparent cards in a sleeve, you like layer them into a custom card. Um, So there's just examples like that. And it's always, you know, that balance, like does the game find enough of its own identity besides just like the gimmick of what it is? Um, but I think that one's done well. I know Dice Forge has done pretty yeah. well. Um, yeah, that I, I thought. Yeah, it's you know, it's a it's not complex. It's it's you can teach the rules really quick, and it does the main you know attraction of it is just 
the upgrading of the dice. It's not like it has this crazy system around it. It's pretty simple. Yeah. But I just think it does it really well. And um, yeah, enjoyable stuff. Nice. Ryan, over to you. Well, that's going to segue into my number two, which is a game that has kind of a, a gimmick core thing and then just wraps it in tons of systems and tons of uh, blo- bloat, you could argue, around it. And that is A Feast for Odin. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Feast for Odin is a big box game from Uwe Rosenberg. He's done a, b- a bunch of these like farming simulations. And um, yeah, I, oh, I, I can see half yeah. of it. Oh, it's just screen. Okay. Um, and so some, some people may uh, be more familiar with his game Patchwork, which is a lighter two-player game that kind of has tetris puzzle pieces that you're puzzling in. Fun fact that Uwe Rosenberg was actually originally working on Feast for Odin, which he was using this kind of puzzling thing, and thought to himself, hey, this could probably be its own game, <laughs> and made Patchwork, which ended up being like a bestseller. That's so funny. Um, but Feast for Odin has that element of you're, you're acquiring these tiles and trying to fill up your board and other boards that you get with these different tiles that represent goods. It's very abstracted, this uh, Viking village yeah. theme. Um, but then it is just wrapped in, I mean, the, the, just the mechanics of the actual tile placement has a lot of extra stuff on it with what can be next to each other and how different things work. But then there's a whole worker placement board with like 60 plus spaces that you can go to that scale from one to four workers and allow you to get get these tiles and flip these tiles to upgrade them to different colors and it's just it's there's yeah, a lot it's, in a lot of ways and there's things i could point to in a feast for odin that are things that like i don't actually love about the design it's really sandboxy open yeah. it does feel like it's got some bloat to it but man every time i play it I'm just like, this game is so fun. <laughs> like, it's just so fun to play. Yeah. Getting the tiles and figuring out how you're going to do the things to get them out. And it had actually been, of games in my collection, one of the longest since playing it. I think I hadn't played it in about a year and a half, which is honestly a crime given that it's been in my you know top 10 games um, of all time that had been that long since I played it. So it was great to get it to the table. I don't know that there was a lot even about this session that was like, really memorable over it other sessions fun. of Feast for Odin. In fact, you know, we've <laughs> talked about how we wish the the cards in that were a little bit more, impactful. you know, drastic yeah. abilities or impactful. I had a game where basically I used my starting occupation uh, and like used that as part of my strategy, but I didn't play a single other, at least ongoing effect. I had like one one-time thing. Yeah. And so it was an example of I got to the end. I was like, I guess I didn't do like that much with cars besides like trash them for right. points. But I still had so much yeah. fun, right? Like even though I would look at that in isolation and be like, man, I wish I could have. I was like, just the things that that game has me do and the types of decisions it has me make and funneling it all into a spatial puzzle. It's so fun. And, and with the Norwegians expansion that adds, um, you know, we have some of the other animals and the artisan sheds and the different shapes and the fact that you have the board that the um has the new column that if you go there with your last action it lets you do something yeah. it's just it's a kitchen sink game and it just i consistently have so much fun playing yeah. it um so it reminded me why i need to get it to the <laughs> table more often you know it's we, we've talked about how you forget how much you enjoy a game when you don't play it for so long um but I had a great time with it. Uh, yeah. Enough to make my number yeah, two. Yeah, I I think both of us don't typically gravitate towards the sandbox kind of Euro games where it's just like each game, you can just kind of decide what the heck you want to do. We, we like a little more construction, yeah. direction. And I think the game just makes up for that in in that the the yeah. board you're just like, oh my goodness, there's so much, so many actions and different and, and it's less of like, oh, what what do I want to do? But uh, once you do kind of get on that on that path, like at the start of the game of a Feast for Odin, I don't love because there's a little bit of that yeah. sandbox feeling of like, OK, you know, hopefully that little card I got helps me just to find my whole strategy or yeah. something like that. But once you get going and you kind of are like, OK, this is kind of what I'm leaning into, then just the all those actions interacting together is is so much fun yeah uh i know for me i i think the game's almost a little hard to get good at because i know a lot of people that you 
introduce it to all the extra islands it's almost like oh how could, how could I, I ever, ever get this? i can hardly, I can hardly finish, finish this <laughs> whereas i feel like good feast for odin players that's like so critical you know yeah and we're not good feast for odin players yeah. but we've at least gotten to the point where we realize you know you hit this point of increasing income on your main board where it's getting more work to keep bumping it yeah. up where if you can get an island you can bump up the income on the island and that can allow yeah. you to you know finish both of and them and that's where still the the sandboxy um, feel of even with the islands it's like oh my gosh you have the choice totally. from 10 islands it's like yeah and ugh. i know like people that are really good at feast road and really know the game they know like the back of their hand all the I island options since they know oh because i'm doing this type of thing like this is the island that's going to yeah. support that well I literally just like glance over there. I'm like, that one looks pretty good to me. <laughs> that one's been passed on a couple times. I'll take the coins. Free silver if I, I take the coins, it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, like I said, it is. I'm able to overlook that just because of how fun. And you know, it's maybe something to be said that like, if some of those things were attuned a little bit more to my personal taste, like this could really yeah. be my, you know, one of my absolute favorite. It already is very high for me. Um, but yeah, great to get to the table. It's not an easy one to get to the table. Um, you got to have the right group. It's not a short game. Um, though I will say, when, as far as big games that haven't been to the table in a long time, Feast for Odin is one that I find easier to remember the rules when I haven't played. Yeah. And I think part of the reason is because it's got that round, the round thing you just moved summary. Down. Yep. And like as I just start going through it, it just kind of comes it back to me. To this remember. is how it works. This is yep. how... So even after a year and a half, I don't think I checked anything in the rules besides maybe something that we would have checked even if we had played it recently because yeah. it was like a specific card or kind of a weird question. But yeah, so it is one advantage of it is um, I feel like it's pretty intuitive once you've played it to get back For into sure. it. Um, but yes, good stuff, but not as good as the two games we're about to That's talk That's right. About, or the two, play, two plays. That's true. It could be the same game. Uh, it could be terrible games, but really, really good plays. Good plays. That's terrible. Okay. Uh, yeah, is it just like how good the play was compared to our view of the game? You know, so yeah, like, it's like this. This game had no right to even be remotely fun. Yeah, but, but hey, I didn't hate it. No, my number yeah. one play is uh, going to a game that is immensely fun. Uh, one of my favorite board games. Uh, I'm so happy that we were able to I'm I'm going to be graduating here from school and moving soon. So I was able to get one final play of this with the, the core group that have played this game so many times before. And that's going to go to Eldritch Horror. Uh, yeah, this was the kind of final game. We, we got together and we're like, we got to play Eldritch Horror one more time. And I always get a little nervous because you can have an Eldritch Horror game that is just so depressing. <laughs> If things go horribly <laughs> and then you're like, wow, we, you know, just spent a couple hours and and did nothing and just got wrecked. Um, and the game was so we played against uh, the uh, ancient one has has I think is how what he's called. But he has uh, only usually you need to solve three mysteries to win the game. He only has two, but the, his mysteries are a lot harder. And so the first mystery yeah. of the game, we as a group need to each have an ally character and there's a way with his ability that you can get ally characters a little bit easier but it, he also like gets rid of your ally characters in, a, in another way so that was kind of hard but so we just need to have an ally character we each need to have at least one clue token and then we need to have spend eight clue tokens in total as a group and eight clue tokens that's a lot um, now we actually had a yeah. great setup because one of our people playing was the um was the girl that can just, if she doesn't have a clue token, can get a clue token every turn. So that was huge. Perfect. Uh, so it was like, okay, we're actually, you know, we're doing pretty good and whatnot. But then things just took a horrible turn. Uh, we So first the guy, uh, <laughs> one of the guys, uh, I think he died. I forget how he died. So he died first. He was like, okay. Um, then this mythos comes up where everyone loses two health and two sanity. It knocked out the three rest of us. So... All of us have now died. We're all with new characters. Our new characters are not as good as our other ones in terms of how they work together. He only started at 11 on the Doom track. So just between those four deaths, you know, that's seven and it's gone down a few more times. We were still on the first mystery over three hours into the game. And we're just, I mean, 
it was just like, oh my gosh, are we gonna, are we gonna ever get here? Are we gonna, uh, you know, ever do it? But then, you know, like can happen in Eldritch Horror, the miraculous, you know, can occur. And we, we band together and we end up getting this mystery solved, but there's like, I don't know, maybe two left on the doom track before he awakens. And so we're like, okay, we'll see what the next mystery is. We flip it. It's an ain't, or it's a, um, one of the epic, epic monster. monsters. Yeah. So we're like, okay, but yeah. the epic monster is on the other side. We're all over here. The epic monster is on the other side of the world. We're like, oh my goodness. So we're like, okay. And he's the, he's this epic monster where he has, I think six health, but you can only do one damage to him every attack. So no matter how much damage you do, oh, you have to do six, hit. you have to do six hits on him. And it's like, oh, we're running out of time. And, but we, the three of them sprint over. I'm over on the other side of the world because I'm going around to all of our dead bodies trying to uh, retreat the doom because I have no way of fighting him. And, and just so many crazy things happen. I mean, the guy across from me, so he ended up having a dark pact and, uh, and we're, we're killing the monster. We're, we're bringing him down. I end up retreating the doom by one by going to the the bodies but then it goes back down and it's at one and we're we're like okay i think we're gonna kill him i think we've got a chance and then we go to the mythos phase and it's a reckoning and the guy across me rolls a one for his dark pact which uh for those of you who don't know a one on a dark pact in elder tour means you have to flip it and it's horrible it's that's the terrible and almost always it means someone's gonna die and if someone dies that's gonna drop the doom we're gonna pretty much lose the game and so we're like oh my gosh that's that's it and he flips it over and it's the one dark pact that we were saved by in that it just gives everyone else a dark pact. So, <laughs> so we all get dark packs. We, we, we kill the monster and then we have to survive one more mythos and it's a reckoning again. And so we all have to roll for our dark packs and we're going to lose the game if any of us roll one. Uh, I, on my previous turn, I had a die roll where I had one die and I needed a success. Otherwise we were going to lose the game because I needed to retreat the doom one and I got it. I mean, and we pulled out just the narrowest of wins. I mean, it was one of those that at the end were just like, how did we do that? (laughs) You know? Yeah. Uh, so, so much fun that the, the final play us as a group got to have together was one that finished really, really strong. That was one of the better you know it the early part of the game could have moved along a little faster it was it was pretty depressing but uh the mm-hmm. way it finished was so exciting and that's really what elder horror i think can deliver uh is those those yeah. crazy unbelievable finishes yeah i mean i think just listening to you describe that play for most people could probably tell them whether they're <laughs> going to be interested in arkham horror or elder not Tor. Because, you know, some will, keep, some will hear things like we were three hours in and we hadn't even finished the first thing. And like, you know, these horrible things yeah. happen and they'll just know like that is not yeah. for me. But others will hear those high moments, right? And like the potential for those high moments and and not just the highs, but the lows, because it's a lot of times that it's gone so low the lows that the highs the are highs, so high because right? it's like we thought there was no way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it's a game that we've, played a lot we've had the games where they don't hit the highs. Oh no, yeah you, you <laughs> just, just keep going the, and then it just keeps going <laughs> <laughs> but for us it's been worth it you know for those games that we get it we do have a full review of elder chore um that we may or may not remember to link at this point um it is a game we we've played quite a bit um yeah i mean uh, <laughs> like i said hearing what you described is really just like a good microcosm yeah. of of what the experience right. of elder yeah that's, is. that's the full elder tour experience right there Okay, yeah. Ryan, hit me with your number one. Yeah, well, while you were globe trotting, you know, holding off impending doom, I was back in the 17th century Oof. when it was not an easy time <laughs> for farming. <laughs> and for those who don't know, that is the tagline for the game Agricola, nice. which is also by Uwe Rosenberg, who did Feast for Odin, my last pick. Um, and where Feast for Odin is the sandbox, we talked about it being very open. Agricola is a little tighter. Just a Puts little you bit. in the chains, and you got to figure out, how am I going to survive? How are me and my family going to survive really- <laughs> and build out yeah. my farm? Um, Agricola is a game I love. I've, I've loved for over a decade. And 
So anytime I can get it to the table, like it's going to have a good chance of making a list like this just because I enjoy it so much. But this was a particularly fun game for me just with the strategy I had. I had one of my higher scores um, that I've had in Agricola. Um, and yeah, it was, it was just a fun game. I had, I'm trying to kind of remember my strategy here. I, I ba- my first occupation that I kind of built things around was the vegetarian, Ooh. which the vegetarian makes it that every time I turn like a grain or a veggie into food through any means, I get an additional food, but I can never cook an animal for the rest of the, you know, the rest of the game. Um, so I was like, okay, I think I'm going to go with the strategy because if I can get like the, I forget if it's the clay oven or which oven is the two stone fr- oven. two times you can convert to four. Yeah, and so I was like, well, that basically becomes a two times I can convert to five with that. Yeah. So that was really good. I had another card that was, um, it was some baking related occupation that let me, when I played it, I got to bake bread. So that was nice because like I could on a turn like, wait on the baked bread action and if i got blocked i could use the occupation to get my important baked bread Mm -hmm. but it was very interesting because it let me place a token on any action space and it made it so that that action space now has also baked bread Mm. which is great for me because i'm like building a you know that's a big part of my strategy but if anybody else takes it and bakes bread i get a free food so i at least like if i ever get blocked from it and I was like, I don't know what space yeah, those to are put this on. Like, I want to put it on something that like I'm gonna use that I want anyway, so I can get dual benefit. But I also don't necessarily want it to get blocked. I ended up putting it on start player, which was very interesting. Yeah. Because and part of the reason I did is I also had a bunch of minor improvements I wanted to play. Okay. Um, yeah. And so I was like, okay, if I do that, in worst case, like I get blocked. And my other piece of that strategy was we were playing a three-player game. And in Agricola, start player is very important. Huge. Like it going to the player to your left is very painful because <laughs> you're last to pick down every round. Not as much in a three-player game, but still a little bit. Fortunately, the player to my right was the only other one that was going to bake bread. Like the other player didn't have any bake bread strategy. So I knew making it more attractive is more likely that the person right before me is going to take start player. So it almost like incentivized him to also get start player, which is better for me than if the other person has it. Um, so that was interesting, but then I had this other, so now I'm not going to be doing anything with animals. So I had this other occupation that at the end of the game for every pasture, that's at max capacity of animals, I get a bonus point. And if all my pastures are that way, I get another bonus point. So I was like, I'm never going to eat animals. I'm just going to, yeah. you know, have a very full setup. And so I was able to, I made a really big two by two square of fences, ended up getting past a minor uh, improvement from my neighbor that, um, or no, that one wasn't past. It was because I used broom. So broom's a minor improvement that if you use it, you discard all your minor improvements and draw new Mm -hmm. ones. So I was able to like sweep in all these new ones. Um, But I got this one that basically lets me immediately build for free four fences within an existing existing pasture <laughs> and so i'm able to take my giant two by two and just put a nice cross in it <laughs> and now i had four wow. squares and then you know i didn't build any stables in them so i just needed two in each to get like the max points um from my stable master uh so it was just you know it was one of those games of a where i felt like i really kind of got my engine going to where i was able to really be opportunistic about going after points and like just having a really strong game. Another thing that was interesting is I ended the game in a wood house. And the reason was I had an occupation. I played a lot of occupations in this game. I had one that gave me a point for every room in my wood house. Mm. So basically treated my wood like a clay. So I was like, it would save me a lot of time and resources to not have to try to renovate to clay, renovate to stone and yeah, oh my gosh, that was that was the killer <laughs> for me this game because I I had to get tons of wood and stuff. I ended up actually getting the uh, it's underneath one of the ovens. It's the major improvement that oh, no matter yeah. what you at most have to heat yeah, one. I know that one. I should have gotten it earlier. I got it like with only two harvests left, but those two harvests I was gonna have to pay yeah. If you're, like if you're so doing much. wood, that's a huge one. Yeah, and it, it was points anyway. Um, so yeah, that was another really big thing is because I. All, got all these actions and resources freed up from not needing to do all the renovate stuff. Not having to go. I ended up collecting stone and buying the well at the end, just as like a points um, thing. Which you know, the well in and of itself was like almost a point per room of what's in mm-hmm. my house. Um, 
So really fun game. It actually prompted me uh, to look into the, like, is there, I, I know there's this revised edition. Now, we've had Agricola since 2011. Yep. Um, 2016, the revised edition came out, but I was like, we, I don't think it makes sense to upgrade. It had a lower player count, less cards. What I didn't realize is in the years since then, they've released like a bunch of deck expansions and the Farmers of the Moor expansion revised. And it, I realized what was all out there and was like, I want that. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> well, it was one of those things. I realized like with what I could sell mine for and what I could get all the new stuff for, I'd probably net like paying $50 or so. And I was like, I would in a heartbeat pay $50 for the additional yeah. card content if it was available for my edition. Um, so I've got that now <laughs> and I'm looking forward to a lifetime of more. Uh, yeah. 17th century farm. Yeah. If that doesn't get you excited about modern board games. I don't know. Well, what? it is interesting because there's not very many Euro games, I feel like, that give such a, I don't know, if, I mean, a little bit stressful, but just like tight. You're just every, I think the thing about Agricola that I love, and I know you feel this way too, especially in contrast to like a Feast for Odin, every action is so critical. So you cannot yeah. have a wasted action. It's it, like you you are just trying to maximize it. And it's that it's that paired with the fact that a lot of things accumulate. Right. So you everything's so important, but then you're given these opportunities that weren't what you were going to do. And it's just like there's six I know. wood, there's four five reed, stone. there's five yeah. stone. I know. It's yeah. like. And I don't need it now, but I know I'm going to need it right. eventually. And it's just such nice decisions. Yeah, yeah it's it's well, good that stuff. is awesome, man. It just makes me want to go out and play Agricola again. Go back to the 17th century. Yeah, it's we're not you know, we love Agricola. There's a large segment of the Internet that calls it Misery Farm. <laughs> so that it gives you like you know, a, we, a contrast like a of, of like how this. Lives. Yeah, that stress rubs yeah, people differently. We, we love it. We love it. Uh, so there you go. That is our top three plays of May. Uh, like we mentioned, uh, we've got links to all of these games down below. And uh, if you want to hear us wax a little bit more on Elder Horror, we've got a link to that video right here. Otherwise, we've got another suggested video right below. And we will see you guys in our next video.